what is Kubernetes, right? So the idea is it's an open source platform that helps you automate and scale basically containers at, you know, in the cloud at scale. Um, I think of it anytime you have more than two servers, right? Um, we're, today we're gonna talk about Docker a lot. Um, Docker works great on one host, but when you scale across many, it's a problem. So we're gonna take the learnings from Google um, and some other people who've contributed and, and apply that to, to this solution. Um, so there's a couple key concepts that make Kubernetes really cool. Um, the first thing is that it's lean. So when you actually deploy out this cluster, deploy out components, not, there's not a whole lot of setup and, and configuration you have to do to get them up and running. Um, it's extensible so that you can plug in your own pieces and parts. Um, if there's a spot that you don't like, you can swap in your own. It's the you know, beauty of open source. If you can see the code and if you don't like it, write your own. Uh, it's portable, so I have a whole cluster running here in my laptop. I can deploy it you know, in my private data center. I can deploy it out to you know, some cloud provider or all the cloud providers. Um, and it also has self-healing. So um, as things come up and down, as, as things die, because this is software and it breaks all the time, um, the system will, will, will account for that and be able to, to self-heal. So this picture here is actually um, Google's first set of computers at Stanford. Um, that part's not important, but what I want to show here is that you know, in the olden days, the olden days uh, we used to give servers names, right? We used to say, hey, this machine on the left was DB01, and the one on the right was called Pam. And they had identities, and we knew wh where they, what they did and, and, and where to go when something went wrong. Well, the first abstraction we're going to talk about is, is breaking that apart, right? So we don't want to have servers give, we don't want to give them identities. We want them to be this giant pool of resource um, that just, you know, is, is flexible and it's, it's homogeneous. So if we look at this picture here, um, it's kind of a more, um, you know, architecture job. So at the top, we have all of our containers, right? And all those pieces and parts um, make up the system that we're trying to deploy. And at the bottom, we have all of our compute. So those are all of our nodes in the system. And in the middle is Kubernetes. So our containers have no idea how many nodes exist or, or, or even if they're alive or not. All they know is that, hey, I have this much resources that I can consume. And if pieces and parts of that infrastructure go down, again, they don't know or care. All they know is that they have less compute available. So here's the high level concepts we're gonna get through. Once we know these pieces, um, we'll be able to, to get rolling on, on our own cluster. So we're gonna talk about nodes, pods, uh, the idea of a scheduler, the idea of labels, replication controller, and then finally service. So the first piece is a node, right? And a node is that VM or our hardware, um, you know, bare metal machine that we're gonna deploy into the cluster. And it has two main jobs. This first job is to run containers. And that container engine can be today Docker or Rocket. Kubernetes supports both. Um, I'm gonna demo today some Kubernetes, or um, some Docker stuff. Um, it's also the second job is to proxy service requests. So this idea of that when things are moving around the cluster, you've gotta get a way to you know, access them and, and make them visible to the world. So um, the node's job is to handle those requests. Uh, there's two binaries that we're gonna deploy. One's called the kubelet and one's called the kube proxy service. That's not important, but that just shows the leanness of it. With those two pieces, you can, you can deploy a node basically. So once we have nodes, we need to deploy something to those nodes, right? And that's what a pod is. And a pod is the atomic unit of a Kubernetes cluster. And basically, it represents a logical application. So a Docker container says, hey, you should have one entry point, one process for any container. And that works great in, in practice. Um, but in real world world, we want to combine things together and you know, keep that separation of concerns. So in this example here, I have two containers, container A and container B. And what makes it easy is that this node is deployed to an, or I'm sorry, this pod is deployed to a node as a single unit. So when I have that understanding, I can now use that to my advantage, right? So I can share volumes. So any kind of volume that I mount, these two containers can share. And I can also share namespaces, so network namespace, IPC namespace. Um, so now that I, can, I can build some applications that work together and apply some software engineering to my infrastructure. So here's an example of what that might look like. So say I have a REST API. Right? And he's handling REST requests and running logs with some volume. Well, then on the right, I could have a logger container. And maybe this is um, you know, log stash and it's, it's shoving this off to Elasticsearch or something. It doesn't really matter. But the idea is that the REST API is just writing logs, and the logger is built to pull those logs in and ship them off somewhere. Now, the cool part is I can take that logger and reuse it other places, right? So if I had other pods that, say, had an Nginx web server, I can slap this, this logger container in and reuse it. I've got one place to test, one place to, to troubleshoot. Um, and if I swap out that, that centralized logging, then, you know, then I can do that once and again apply that across my cluster. Cool, so now that we have pods and we have nodes, now we need to, something to tell us where to put those where, and how to do that. And we're gonna do that with a scheduler. 
So the scheduler's job is to basically decide where do I pick this pod and who has room for it. Um, so the, the scheduler takes a look at all the nodes in your system and based on requirements you can set, it'll, it'll take its best guess that, hey, this should run here. And it'll tell, hey, run this, run this pod on that node. Um, today, um, it, it's, it's getting better, but it's, it's not super, um, super smart yet. But it's pluggable, so there's another place where you can swap in your own scheduler if you'd like. Cool, so the next scheme concept is labels. Um, labels in a system are simply just key value pairs. Um, and the simplicity of that makes it really complex and makes, makes it easy that you can, you can do a lot with the system once you have this, this basic understanding. So um, I, can, I can label anything in Kubernetes with a label. Um, and with that key value pair, I can then query and, and, and slice things up. So here's an example of, of four pods, say, that I have in my cluster, right? And I've given these labels to them, and it's, this is something that I've just made up. So if I want, you know, you think of if you had thousands and thousands of these objects, it's hard to manage and get used to. So say I run a, a query where a type is front end. Well, from there, it'll just return those top two pods based on that one label query. I can also say, hey, give me the type where the environment's production, and I'll get all my production nodes from the system. And lastly, I can say, hey, give me the type is Steve, and maybe that's pods that I've created in the system, so I can get a view of everything that I've created or, or broken and take action against that once I know that. Cool, so the next piece is desired state. Um, so the idea here is, is Kubernetes doesn't care how you got from state one to state two to state three. All it knows is that you define what you want it to look like, right? So an example of that in the real world is the thermostat here in the room. So we set it to be, say, 70 degrees. Well, if the room's too hot, then the thermostat will call for cooling. It'll say, hey, cool it down. And if the room's too cold, it'll ask for heat. So Kubernetes does the same thing. So we can apply, apply that logic to, to pods and, and, and things within the system. So if I say, hey, um, I'm gonna create some pods in the system. When I first deploy my cluster, I have nothing. So I'm gonna say, hey, create three pods. And the system will say, hey, I have none running, but you want three. Let's take action and create three of them. So it'll do that work, and it'll, three pods will get created. Similarly, if I have too many pods and I wanna reduce capacity, I can change my state to say, hey, desired state is one, but I wanna have um, I'm sorry, I want to have one, but I have three. So it'll take action and delete two of those pods out. So those concepts are the same, it's the same action it's, it's doing, creating and deleting. It's just looking at what I want to have, what the world is, and then taking action to make that so. So we can apply this to health checks, right? So say I want to have three pods running, and at some point I had three running, but now I don't. Maybe a node died, something crashed. It doesn't care how it got there. All it knows is that you want to have three, I have one. So take an action. Let's create two of those pods. So how we can define that desired state is with a thing called a replication controller. And this is simply, basically, um, a way to define your pod, right? So you can do this with JSON or, or, or YAML files. And you can define what the pod looks like. So you can say, hey, here's the Docker images that I'm gonna run, here's the labels I'm gonna apply to these pods, and here's the CPU memory requirements I wanna apply. I can also specify a replica count. And the replica count is how many instances do I want running at any given time within the cluster. And you can define that here. And that's just defining that desired state. Cool, so now that I have all these cool comp components in there, um, I need a way to find them, right? So when I scheduled all these pods in my cluster, how do I know where they are? Because again, I have no concept of, of what host they're running on. Well, I do that with a thing called a service. So um, back on that computer screen where I had Google's computers, I had DB01, right? And I configured my API to talk to DB01. And that worked okay, but then when DB01 died, I had problems. So what I'm gonna do is put a service in front of those pods. And what we'll do is we'll define a selector on the, on the service, and we'll say, hey, this selector selects these pods. So when we looked at those label queries, that's how the service will know what, what pods to send requests to. So um, yeah, so a service gets a dynamic um, IP. It also gets a DNS address if you've installed that plugin. Um, and you can think of a service as basically a mini load balancer. So anytime you build a cluster of servers, you want to put a load balancer out front. And when you get to a microservice architecture, you should put load balancers in front of every layer of your app. That's what the service is doing. Okay, um, so here's how you create one, and here's kind of some nitty-gritty details of how, how that might look. Um, so an API server will say, hey, let's create a service, and that queue proxy running on a node will get that request, and it'll write an IP table route to the system. And then when a request comes in from a client, say on some port, IP tables will get that and say, hey, don't let the system have it. Give this to the, to the proxy service. The proxy service will then take a look and say, hey, what pods match this query? And it'll pass that off to that, to that pod to get handled. 
And again, that pod may or may not be on this machine. It doesn't matter where in the cluster the request came from, it'll still get handled. So here's, an, here's another example of a three-tier architecture, and this will come in handy um, for, for my demo next. So here I've got a front-end service, I've got a, an API in the middle, and I've got a database, and I put services in front of each one of those. So you can see, like on the front end, where I've set the selector is front end. Any pod that matches that will, will handle requests. Um, now at the bottom, you can see I only have one database running. And it might seem silly to have a service in front of that, but it's still important to do that, even if your, your replica is set to one, so that no matter where your database spins up in the cluster, you'll be able, you'll be able to find it. OK, so let's look at some demos. Actually, today my whole cluster died, and I rebuilt it during the break. So hopefully, hopefully we're good. Let's turn this back on. OK, so what I have is this is um, a Docker Compose file. So if you don't know what Docker Compose is, it's a way to define um, Docker containers and run them all together quickly, like in a dev environment. So what I have is that same three-tier architecture. Can you see that? So what I have is an Nginx web server running here. It's running this image. And I have an API server, which is actually a Spring Boot app. Again, it doesn't really matter. I'm just giving you background. Um, then I have a database, which is MySQL. So what we do is if we look at, um, at this running here, I will prove that this works by refreshing that. And you can see this behind the scenes. You see it all flashing by. So there's my app running in Compose, right? And I built this, this website for today. It's pretty sweet. OMG the bacon, right? So I'll prove that it actually, I'm not, there's no smoke and mirrors here. I'll kill Compose, I'll refresh, and it's dead, right? So that's cool. So let's deploy this out to Kubernetes. So we'll go back to here. And first, let's take a look at what we have in a cluster, right? So I'm going to use a tool called Cube Control. And Cube Control is, is an entry point to our API. The API server, you can do anything with in the cluster. And Cube Control is just sending API requests. So if I say, hey, get nodes, right? It returns and it says, I have three nodes. So I have three nodes running here in my machine. And you can see I have labels on them. They don't mean a whole lot today. They're just IP addresses. But um, you can see that they're all ready. So if I take a look at, um, I can say get pods. And you'll see here's all the pods in the system. Go again. That better. So there's the pods. And you can see I have four versions of web, web one running, which is great, right? So I've scaled out my app. But the API server has only got one. Let's change that and let's resize that and make it bigger. So let's scale out the API to be size four. So I'm just now changing desired state. So desired state was one, now it's four. So when I submit that request, and I look at my pods again, you'll see that there's three more that just popped in. Because the system saw that desired state changed, and it took an action to create three of them. And you can see how there's three of them, three of them not running. So this is confusing. So let's, let's query it on the label, right? So we'll say name is API. And there's the power of labels, where I can just get that one slice of the cluster, right? And now you can see that. Um, Four, four running, so we scaled our scaled out our app. And maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe let's go back, and that's too many. Let's go back to two. So we'll change state again, and we'll go to two. And now instantly there's two. It killed two of those pods, and, and now they're gone from the cluster. So let's take a look at our app again in Kubernetes and make sure that it was working. And it looks great. It looks like Compose, but I did some Pittsburgh, Pittsburghese here, and I spelled Pittsburgh wrong. And this kind of flashing is too 90s for me, maybe. So luckily, I noticed this this morning as well. So let's push an update. And what we're going to do is we're going to form a rolling update to the system. So I'm going to take one version of my container. I'm going to apply a new version. And I'm going to do it in order. So I'm not going to kill the system and have downtime. I'm going to do it in a kind of controlled manner. So what I'm going to do is do a rolling update from version 1.0 to, um, to version 2. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a two-second period in between. So what's going to happen here is I'm just going to manipulate state. I'm going to create a new replication controller with the new version 2 controller. It's going to spin up a pod. And then I'm going to take one, one out of the version 1. So I'll have three version 1s and one version 2. And then I'll keep iterating over that as I go through. So let's watch that. So you'll see here I have three replicas of version 1 and one of version 2. And then once that deploys that pod out, then it'll, it'll change state again. It'll add one to version two and take one away from version one. And you'll see I'll go to two, two. See there's two, two. And if we take a look at our system, you'll see that I have two version twos and three version ones. So it's rolling this update out in parallel. And as soon as that next pod changes and that goes successful, it'll wait two seconds and then spin up the next one. You'll see now I have three version twos and two version ones. And this will happen. And this can happen again at scale. I don't know. I mean, we know we have three nodes here, but I could have a thousand nodes, and this would go and find all those pieces. 
So we're almost done. As soon as one more goes away. Okay, so that will finish. <clears throat> now I have zero version ones down, so I fully deployed my app. It says update succeeded. Let's go back to my app here, refresh. And now I've deployed the new version. Pittsburgh spelled correctly and the blinky text is all gone. Cool. So that's pretty much all I have. I just want to give a quick shout out to Brendan Burns from Google, who's the lead on the project, and Kesley Hightower from CoreOS. It's been lots of indirect help for me over the last year in getting this up and running. Uh, so thank you.